Muchas gracias, eh, María Beatriz. Eh, muy interesante. Thank you. Thank you so much. I wonder if you would comment on um, uh, Sen has a very thoughtful piece comparing uh, China and India in terms of the pathway to um, uh, development, qua uh, investments in education and in health. Could you comment a little bit about how you see the difference between, say, um, <coughs> what we see in South America, uh, the China path, and the India path? Um, I haven't seen the study. I haven't seen the same study, but I've read other things. Uh, I like Marta Son very much, his work. Um, but I, I think I can give some comments about the different development paths, not, not the specifics, but uh, first, I think very important comment, I think that marks a difference is um, Latin America is mostly open societies, democratic societies. China is not a democratic society. Um, and, and India is a democratic society, but with, with a caste system, which is, uh, has some difficulties, you uh, know? And uh, still also the, the, the government has very strong intervention in, in the economy and society. Why has China succeeded so much? The, there was a very good uh, study by, by a Korean economist, Chang, back um, 10 years ago that uh, it was called kicking the ladder. The ladder is a symbolism, the ladder to economic progress, no? And um, he, he said that basically after the, 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 the signing of the agreements of the WTO and all those agreements restricting the, the active industrial policies of developing countries, what developed countries did was kick the ladder for the progress of developing countries. They used all these incentives before, and once they were developed, they, they, they didn't leave the, the space for developing countries to do it. However, with China, it was different because China, the, the, both Europe and the United States, who were leading the efforts of the general agreement of tariffs and trade, liberalization and the GATT, and then the formation of the WTO, they were very much interested in accessing the China market because it was the largest market in the world. So they gave China the right to use the ladder. The accession agreement in China, uh, the, of China to WTO allows China to do a lot of things that neither Brazil could do, neither Argentina could do. Mexico, if we had export subsidies, we immediately will face compensation of regulation. You couldn't subsidize, uh, 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 you couldn't use local content rules. You couldn't use quantity of things that China has used. If, if you really look at industria, China has been very active in all industrial policies even copying not what developing countries were doing, but also copying what developed countries do. For instance, the, 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 I also did a study which is published in, in a book, which is the issue of public purchases. Public purchases and in, uh, public contracts or public in, in the developed world is, is, is an active industrial policy. It's used, of course, in, in a framework of transparency and efficiency, but to promote, co uh, it's called public purchases for innovation, public purchases to promote small and medium enterprises, public pur purchases to promote green uh, purchase, uh, purchases. However, when they negotiate with us, like when the European Union negotiate with us, the first requisite is you should have a, a complete open system, it's like with capital control, with no preferences to, to no strategic preferences in the, in the framework. So the, the China used very active industrial policies had the advantage of, of uh, 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 an undervalued exchange rate, uh, very cheap uh, labor, and also cheap capital, which is related to the issue of subsidies. I mean, public development banks in, in China finance the state-owned enterprises with the ridiculous cost of capital. Of course, they are going to, I mean, how no, they are not going to win. And it's a centralized, it's a plant economy. In the United States, when I, when I taught at MIT, in the only place where you could talk about planning was in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning. In the only place, in the, talking about neoclassical economics, planning is only conceived 
wh when you have space dimension. Why? Because space introduces a monopoly. Having an apartment in, in Piazza España is not the same as having an apartment in the outside you know, of Rome. So there are locational advantages, there are monopoly advantages. So you need to plan because there is an, an issue of monopoly with space and location. So that's the only, but there is a plant economy, a plant economy. The whole strategy for the digital economy is planned. In artificial intelligence, my impression is that China is way ahead of the United States right now. And that's the discussion between. But we're not playing by the same rules. The rest of the developing world, we, we don't have the ladder. Maybe, like I say, we can use it to, to, to develop exports in, in the uh, knowledge intensive sector. And the other ladder, the ladder, because the two areas where you can sustainably develop agriculture in the world and feed the growing population and end with hunger in Africa, it's Africa and Latin America. But in order to do that, you need open, you need to, to end agricultural protectionism. And for that, the developed countries, they have a debt. They signed the WTO agreement, the agriculture agreement. In the Article 20, they said they were they committed to a reform, continuous reform in the sector, in agriculture sector. Against that, the developed countries gave intellectual pro, pro, uh, property protection, uh, open manufacturing, etc. It was never fulfilled. It was never fulfilled. And you have 12 years, 12 years, and I told this to Pascal Lamy. We were in the same seminar, I was sitting, the same secretariat, with nobody saying anything, no multilateral round being negotiated, the NOHA round was never negotiated, the agriculture agreement was not implemented, and this organization doesn't have an external auditing system. So you don't deliver, and nobody says anything in the world. And Africa, you have millions of people dying of hunger, millions of children, like you say, that cannot get adequate education, immigration into, into Europe, leading to, to polarization, and, and populism, finally, because of all the conflicts. And who addresses these issues? I mean, Argentina can get the way. Argentina is rich. Brazil is relatively rich. But what about, what about Africa? Uh, so, sorry to, to get. So I think, basically, uh, China benefited from uh, a space to do active industrial policies that the rest of the de developing world didn't have. A very centralized economy. In an economy, you need to build consensus. I mean, to okay. pass any tax measure, you need to build consensus. So it allows more effective planning. And they have invested heavily on education of people. And Thank that's you. the key. And the same in India. They have invested at least in, in the technology okay. sector, in the software sector. They are, they are a leader, and they have invested in, in education for certain castes, no? not for everybody. Now, uh, yeah, Cecilia and then Gustavo, please. I have a question, maybe in the same direction, but concerning uh, the poorest people in developing countries, and you insist on the, uh, the, the need for upgrading the skills of young people, especially. And at the same time, for example, I have in mind concrete situations that I experienced both in India and Mexico. And for example, in India, I discussed with public authorities in Chennai about the fact that when you, you go to a, a ministry, you see uh, many, many uh, civil servants and, and, and it's not digitalized at all. And they told me that they had decided, I think it's at the federal level, not to, uh, to digitalize because they said it would um, create unemployment for millions of Indians and it's not possible. So for me, there is a real question, even if we try to, uh, maybe it's true for the next generation, try to upgrade the skills, but then for uh, dozens of millions of, of, of people right now, what, what is the, maybe what could be the, the, uh, an acceptable solution and then what kind of safety nets for these okay. people? And, uh, and the same with, for example, automatization in recycling activities and, and waste uh, management in Mexico. We discussed also with public authorities and finally they had decided not to automatize. They had made some, uh, s some um, experimentations and they saw that for the most vulnerable people, the situation was worse off because they were left aside. And in fact, it was not benefiting to, to the ones who, who had not the capabilities to require some new skills or, and I think it's, for me, it's, it's it also, it's a matter of discernment of what 
could be done, uh, maybe, uh, well, and envision different possibilities, maybe it depends on the countries and on the specific situations and on maybe of the number of, of people who are concerned. But so my question is about, well, uh, to what extent do we have to upgrade the skills in order to automatize or is it just, right. uh, and, and then safety nets for the okay. yeah. The Congratulations, Beatrice, for your excellent presentation. You have shared with us very specific proposals. Um, I think that would be very interesting for us that you share um, with us some of your experience regarding the G20 process. Okay. You have had the privilege of attending the Germany meetings, also the Argentine meetings, then the Japan meetings, and now the meetings and in okay. Arabia. Um, what are the, which are the main problems and the, the main obstacles that you find in terms of discussing more deeply the issue of the future of work right. in these okay. um, summits? You know, again, very, uh, thanks for the presentation. Just this is very, very quick, going back to the diagnosis. And I know you've touched on some of these issues, but the way I like look at it, you have the forces affecting wages and inequality, or as you've described, technology. There's also globalization. But what I'm, you would be interested in your views on the, and the intersection between the economics and the politics. Okay. Because I think that the, you, you get this dynamic cycle once you have inequalities generating because of technology and globalization, that in turn affects the political process, then you get policies that benefit the rich, and it just gets magnified. We saw this in the early 20th century, we're seeing it in the early 21st century, and it didn't end well the first time. So I'm just wondering how at a national and global level we can kind of break this political economic cycle. I know you've touched on some of these issues, but I was just wondering, it, to me, this is kind of center as to what's going on. Well, three very good questions. Um, regarding the skill acquisition question, I think um, digital skill acquisition and uh, digital uh, introduction of technology in, in, in areas in public sector, public sector government, or public sector led activities like waste management where you, you employ a lot of unskilled people that can be affected. First, in skill acquisition, I think you have to differentiate whether, and the initiatives you or policies you regard, whether you are referring to people, uh, first, whether it's a stock or a flow problem. If it's a stock problem, it's with existing workers. If it's a flow problem, then it's an education problem. It's not a training problem. It's when you start, and, and what other values other than digital skills, no? whether you emphasize social skills, interpersonal skills, which everybody agrees is not just digital skills, the holistic human or humanistic education, and some transferable skills, that's what the professional network call for creativity, adaptability, teamwork, et cetera, that is very much valued in today's world of work. So um, the skill, I think for skill acquisition um, uh, eh, 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 of marginalized uh, populations that are not in the job market, um, I don't know in the world, but in Argentina, there, I, I quote them, there are three amazing initiatives that are small initiatives but could be scaled up. Um, one is called uh, uh, Potrero Digital in, in, in La Juanita. You know that of a movie director, Campanella is a Nobel Prize, Nobel uh, Oscar uh, awarded movie director. It, Potero Digital in, in English will be like digital stable, the place where the horse is. And they, um, they, they um, attract, they don't employ, well, they, they provide employment, training for kids that do not go to school, young people, do not work, that otherwise will be in the streets selling drugs. And they train them on digital skills to export video games uh, because Campanella also did a football game in, 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 in with um, uh, comics, etc. to the United States. I mean, that's amazing. And these kids, 
will never go to a formal job, will never wear a suit, will never work eight hours, but they have the digital skills, and this is what to, or smartphones, like you said, they don't have shoes, but they have a smartphone. So they have some form of digital skills, and they can be included. But this is what, an effort of a person that is committed, small, with no support from large technology companies, with no support from governments. I mean, you need to scale up. This can be done. Uh, you have one, but that's the technology is being substituted also by another social leader, Toti Flores, that was more like a call of call center, that the technology is already automated in the call centers. And the third one, which is very interesting, is the um, Arbusta. Arbusta was created by one of the partners of Mercado Libre. Mercado Libre is the Amazon for Latin America. It's a company developed by a group of Argentines. One is Marco Galperin, who actually now is three times the value in New York and quoted in the markets in New York of YPF, of the petroleum company. And it employs 15 South and young people. My youngest daughter work, works in Mercado Libre and she's an economist and she has done a course in data science and data analytics. And she's happy, she, she has flexible work hours. One day she works at office, she works a lot, but she's happy. Well, one of the partners who made a lot of money with this decided to do a social impact company. But a social impact company that earns money, Arbusta, is very worth really learning from their experience. They only employ and train people from marginalized areas. They don't employ middle, um, uh, middle class kids like my daughter. <laughs> they employ, they train them, and they provide services to Facebook, to, to, the, to, to, to the large uh, software companies, and they do this for a profit. Of course, they, they don't want 30% profit, but reasonable profit, 8%, they don't lose money. And I was talking to the woman who leads this effort, uh, and she said, Beatrice, even tasks of intelligence of artificial intelligence, agents, they're simple tasks that you need to order the information, and you can train people to do this, and the people feel so proud. They feel so realized. I mean, they, uh, so, of course, these are small initiatives. They depend on the goodwill, on the humanity of certain individuals, but we need to have policies to scale this. Uh, the governments have to have, I mean, for me it's amazing. I had to make comments on a report of making trade for work for all written by the IMF, the World Bank, and, and, and the OECD. And in that report, since, since opening trade has the same sort of structural impact as technology, you reallocate labor from less efficient to more efficient activities. You have the problem of labor reallocation and transition and retraining, and they, they point out in that report that both Europe and the United States, less than 1% of their national budget is allocated to retraining. And then we complain about increasing inequality <laughs> in the midst of the profound technological change, in the midst of the eruption of China in world markets. I mean, you're doing nothing. You're standing there and doing very little. Huh? So. That's uh, the Swilla with vision. Uh, regarding the introduction of technology, I think here what the Pope Francis said, the human dignity must be a government priority and a business priority. Uh, whatever, if you automate, you have the responsibility to retrain and to reallocate people. It's not like I introduce the technology and you look for a job somewhere. And maybe this should be enacted in the same way we enact the, the, no, the long life learning, we want to enact it right. Maybe with in this area of very bad, because it's, the change is exponential, the speed of change is very much different than in the past. Huh? It's very much different. So I think maybe this is, the, the, this is something that has to be thought about. Because the technology finally, you can, you can put a break now, you can decelerate now, but finally it will get there. So you are postponing the problem. You will have to deal with the problem in the future. Maybe that's good when the country Suppose you are in the midst of a, an economic crisis and you have an employment, an unemployment problem. You don't want to start, no, um, putting technology, automated technology into waste management. And, but if you are not that kind of situation and you can reallocate because you have employment growth, maybe this is the moment. Huh? So according to the context, you can make a wiser decision. Future of work okay. in, 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 well, um, in G20, like I said, G20 took the issue. It's of extreme interest to everybody, but the interest of the emerging countries is not the same as the interest of, of the advanced countries. 
I have not been following this year so much future of work because one, once you're in, G20, in T20, you have to contribute to policy briefs within one. During Argentina, I did contribute, uh, but this year I had to choose and, and, and the Japanese um, uh, chair of the T20 asked me to be co-chair with him uh, in the uh, sustainable investment, infrastructure investment work uh, task force. So I, I did two papers, one on the Amazonian securing natural capital and other on, uh, another one on the policy framework for delivering sustainable infrastructure. But what I've got from other people is that, uh, for instance, Japan, the, the finally, I think at the G20 was an agreement proposed on, on, on data flows, on freeing data flows, and two countries didn't sign it. India didn't sign it, and South Africa didn't sign it. When I was Sherpa, they, yeah. and, and, and also Germany wanted to go ahead with eliminating for life all tariffs on digital trade, Neither, neither India or neither South Africa wanted because they say we don't know, we don't have a measure of digital trade, we don't have a common definition of digital trade. Doha was never delivered. Agriculture sector is not open. We have already opened manufacturing, intellectual property. We're going to open digital trade without a definition, without a form of measurement. And what are we getting in return? Why should we sign this? So there also there is a difference of interest. Some. Like I say, I think when we introduce it, we introduce it in order to really assess the impact of technology on the labor market, and it's a menu of policy options that, that was the result of the work of multilateral organizations that was uh, contributed. The leaders didn't say too much about it. There were not initiatives. And afterwards, with Japan, it's much more a data issue, and now Saudi Arabia is introducing the issue, but we don't know because yet the that. government has not announced the priorities. But the issue is going to remain because the digitalization is a transversal issue for all of us, so it's going to remain. But according to who has the presidency, I think it's going to have uh, the, the, the focus and the approach. Uh, regarding the political okay. process, uh, I couldn't agree mar much more with uh, you, Antoine. I, I mean, policy, uh, the political process, my experience is very unpredictable. But inequality is really uh, lead to polarization and, and, and lead to backlash and lead to, so we should avoid further inequalities, whatever measures we can take at, at the international level. And of course, this technology, like we say, has opportunity, but also has tremendous risk. So we need uh, to coordinate better policies and better actions. And I think international organizations have a key role to play here. And for instance, the research, the research done by IMF is amazing. It's amazing, but why don't we divide uh, and also get the technology companies to make, m to make much more open? We need an agreement at the G20 level on what the new technological developments are, what we can expect. We, we, we're doing an ex post analysis. We, we, we cannot do an anticipated analysis. Uh, uh, so, so uh, I agree with you. I, I don't have an answer for, for the Thank relevant you. question you raised. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now Thank we you. have. A, if you are agreeable, let us Thank have a, only 15 minutes of break, coffee break, so that uh, because some people have to leave uh, a bit in advance. Okay, so we are a small group. 15 minutes. Uh, we convene for the final dulcis in fundo by Rocco Buttiglione. Okay.